might I say what a joy it is to be in St Andrews. Uh, and it's great to see so many people here this evening on the lecture about cult heritage. Uh, and it's a sheer pleasure for me to, to attend. Um, the background to this discussion on Professor Tate started with the club history that I was involved with doing for my own club in York, which was published the back end of 1989. And very soon after publication, the secretary called me and said, we've had a letter from a Miss Tate in St. Andrews. And she's interested in Freddie Tate. Uh, and my ears pricked up at this. Uh, and it turned, and, and, and knew that Freddie had obviously had quite a large family. And I soon worked out that this was Miss Margaret Tate, who lived at Howard Place, only about a quarter of a mile from here. Uh, and she was collecting items about Freddie Tate, looking for information and any memorabilia associated with him. And she had a great collection, a personal collection of things associated with Freddie. And I know that Hannah has curated a lovely exhibition which I saw this afternoon about Freddie, which is, was running last year. Uh, and, and it's a great tribute to uh, one of the great heroes of Scottish golf. I very quickly got into correspondence with this date. Uh, and that lasted for about five or six years, up to the time when she began to fail the back end of the uh, 1990s. Uh, and she almost made up to 90 years old before she died. Uh, and I managed one visit in 1919, just before the open, uh, and I was able to find out lots of information about her and her family. <coughs> and the deal never spoken, but the, the unspoken deal between us was that I would look for things associated with Freddie uh, uh, for her collection. And she would provide me with other bits of information about the family that I found terribly interesting. And a lot of it was family and friends, uh, contemporary in the 1880s, 1890s. Uh, so and a lot of it was juicy gossip that <laughs> was very entertaining to read and to find out about. So it's something that I had a great interest in keeping going. Miss Tate was the son of John Tate, who was Freddie's elder brother, born in the 1860s. He's on this picture. This is a picture of him at, I think it was Cambridge, but it might have been Oxford. John was, that's John Weir. You can see the family resemblance. He was a good golfer. He got to the semi-final of the amateur long before Freddie started playing in it, in 1886-87. Uh, he was a great footballer, rugby footballer, and this is a picture of him playing in the, in the Cambridge team of the 1870s, 1880s. He got two Scottish caps at a time when Scotland were very strong, beating everybody else. And he was a first class shot. Uh, and he shot at Wimbledon with the National Rifle Association and later possibly at Bis Bisley. I'm not quite sure about exactly where. <coughs> she was the niece of Freddie Tate. So Miss um, Tate was born out in India, where her father was professor of English at Bombay University. Freddie, as we know from Hannah's exhibition, great champion in 1896, 98. He was with the Black Watch Regiment, he served with the Black Watch Regiment as a lieutenant, never made captain, but he would have done soon after the Boer War, which so cruelly killed him in 1900. <coughs> he played at my club in York and the club, ever sensitive to the need for publicity, immediately elected him to the committee and as a committee member to see if they could take advantage of his great fame. Uh, as we know, he was wounded at Magis Fontaine uh, very early in the war, and soon after his recu recuperation, 
He was killed in the Modder River, at the Modder River in 1900. <coughs> For the subject of my talk this evening is Peter Tate, the father. Born in 1830, he was the son of John Tate, who was a secretary to the Duke of Buccleuch, who lived in Dalkeith, he was educated privately, then at Edinburgh Academy, and then went down to Peterhouse, Cambridge, <coughs> where he won the first, one of the, one of the prize medals for uh, uh, his, his subject, which was physics and mathematics. At an early age, he got his first chair at Queen's University in Belfast, at the age of 23, and rapidly was promoted to the chair at Edinburgh at the age of, 18 to, uh, of 29. One of his competitors for that chair was James Clark Maxwell, one of the giants of the toy of science. But Tate beat him to that particular chair. And he held that chair until his death, just before his death in 1901. <coughs> His particular subjects were a subject, one of the subjects that I, I'm totally unfamiliar with, quaternions, which is a branch of mathematical physics that is so obscure, but I'm, I'm told it's still relevant to uh, some subjects today. Thermodynamics, uh, and he was also well known for his theories on knots. He was awarded for his scientific work, he was awarded the uh, gold medal of the Royal Society in 1887. And on my visit to the state in 1990, she showed me this gold medal. It's a huge thing, about quarter of an inch thick, of tremendous bullion value. And it was most of all the medals, the Tate medals, in her display cabinet. That was the one that stood out of three. Absolutely magnificent. So it was a great, great, impressive thing. He's also well known because he collaborated with the other great Scottish scientific figure of the day, William Thompson, uh, who later became Lord Kelvin at Glasgow University. And they put together uh, a very well-known, popular textbook on physics, which was known as by the author's name is Thompson and Tate, popularly known as T and T, and you can still buy copies of that at a premium on Tate Books or eBay. Tate was also a golfer. In his early days, he played at Brunsfield Links. I don't know if he's a member of the, any of the Brunsfield Links societies. I suspect he was. He lived at that time in Marchmont, which is quite close, and he used to walk into the university uh, and sometimes have a game of golf before he started his day's work at the university. He was also a member of the Honourable Company, which at that time was playing at Musselburgh. And round about the 1870s, he began taking family holidays in St Andrews, became a member of the RNA. He was a very literary man and enjoyed playing around with words. He wrote lyrics for songs, some of which were published. I think the best one, the best known one, which I'm not going to sing, Anna, <laughs> was a, a, a song called Beautiful Round. It was published in Kerr's book about the Gulf and East Lothian in 1896. And around about the same time it was published in a book of golfing songs, also edited by John Kerr, uh, uh, around about that, in, in, that, in that time, 1896. I have actually sung it with a small group in the past. It's very tuneful, but I'm not going to try it tonight. <laughs> around about the time that John and his younger brother, Freddie, were becoming really good at golf in the late 1880s, Professor Tate became interested in the flight of the golf ball. And Miss Tate told me 
that he became interested in while sitting with some fishermen watching drives off the bus tee just down there uh, in one of the RNA competitions on a windy day. And the fishermen were able to forecast the way in which the ball was going to fly, whether it hook or whether it would slice, depending on the way in which the golfers were hitting the ball. At that time, Tate would have been familiar with feathery balls. I suspect he never actually played with them. They would be going out of fashion in the 1860s when he was starting to play golf. So most of his experience would have been with the gutty ball, which is shown on this display here. The original ones were smooth, the three dark ones in the middle. And then they realized very early on that smooth balls didn't fly very well. And there is a good old story that when people started hacking with them, and they started making indentations in the surface of the ball, they flew better. So Professor Tate would have been familiar with this. And from those very early days in the 1850s, when gutty balls were becoming popular, first of all, as we know, they used to hammer the back of the ball with a the, with hammer the ball with the back of a hammer to make indentations, to make them fly better. Later on, they used to cut incisions in the surface of the ball. And I think there's a, a ball cutting machine downstairs in one of the displays. But most of the balls that he was then starting to consider by in the late 1880s, beginning of the 1890s, were molded balls. So we had lot, we began to see lots and lots of different patterns on these balls. Sometimes there were indentations, sometimes there were lines that were cut, and others of the balls were pimpled. Those balls were called brambles. Tate was also familiar from the scientific literature about the way in which the reasons, the phenomenon of sliced balls, of sliced sports balls, and this had been noted as early as the 17th century by Isaac Newton when he was watching games of tennis. And just like Andy Murray would slice the ball into the far right or well, loop one over in the left hand corner. Uh, Newton was observing games of tennis, of real tennis sports, and recognized the phenomenon of hitting the ball obliquely and making it curve, making it curve in the air. And that's clockwise the spin, that's what happens. As well as that, there was a German scientist called Gustav Magnus in the 1850s, again, fairly recently as far as Tate was concerned, who had done experiments on revolving cylinders in flows of air. And again, the, he, has given his, he has given his name to the phenomenon of the Magnus effect to describe the way in which balls or projected spheres veer off in the air when they've been hit with a slice or a hook. Not just a, a slice or a hook, but when they've been hit with backspin. Andy Murray's great defensive shot is the backspin, the chop backspin that hangs in the air before it lands at his opponent's feet in the back of the court. So Tate determined to see if he could work out the metrics of why golf balls, how, why and how golf balls moved and span. He first <coughs> investigated the degree of elasticity of the material, of the gutter patch material that golf balls were made from. And again, this is a, a phenomenon that 
or it's, 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 a, it's a value that had been calculated again as early as the 17th century by Sir Isaac Newton. Tate constructed an experiment in which the material in question, the material whose elasticity was being tested, was stuck held fast in the ground. And from a height, and I'm not sure what the height was, I would imagine four or five feet, of about four or five feet, he organized for a wooden guillotine, sometimes faced with steel, to be dropped onto the material in question. And the degree to which it bounced back was something that he wanted to measure. And rather than measuring it in one dimension, he measured it in two dimensions. And he organized for a stylus to be attached to the guillotine that cut a path on a revolving glass wheel that had been covered with printer's ink. And this demonstration here, this exhibit here, is of one of Tate's original schematics from his experiment. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to work out, it's difficult to work out how how, he's, uh, how he does his calculation. The fact that the, the wheel is revolving at a fixed speed, and if you know that speed, means that you can do measurements that will allow you to work out how big some of the things are. My interpretation of this, and I'm happy to be... I think it is. Is it working? Oh yes, it's closed. My interpretation of this is that the, the wheel is revolving, and at that point there, the guillotine is, re is released. It, it goes boing, right down to the bottom. It rebounds up to that level there, boing right down there, back there, and then decreasing bounces until it finishes around about here. Uh, um, if anybody of a scientific persuasion wishes to work out the detail of this. The explanation is contained uh, in the source that I found out. It's actually the, uh, the Proceedings of the Royal Society of, of Edinburgh. And I, I found this on the website of uh, Toronto University. Um, so, but it, it's obscure, but it's there. And the explanation that the scientific, the original scientific paper is there. Tate also was able to measure from this the extent to which the guillotine hit the material under, under study. And I, I would take that to be the extent of the depression of the material uh, and he was able to calculate the time that this took and he calculated it at one ten thousandth of a second. That was a, a figure that can later be adjusted and refined. He also did experiments on smooth gutta percha as opposed to Pattern got a picture to see if there's any difference in resilience between smooth and pattern because he knew that pattern got a picture balls flew better than smooth ones. So he's checking out to see if there's any difference in resilience between the pattern balls and the smooth ones. He couldn't find any difference. They had the same coefficient of restitution. That's the coefficient that he was measuring, and he, he calculated that at 0.65. Right, so he investigated the resilience of the material. His next investigation was 
of the speed of the ball as it leaves the club face. And it was an interesting, that's an interesting figure for him because he's aware of uh, figures from military physicians, military engineers, um, who do calculations of uh, how, how far a range of a bullet or a cannonball or a missile would be uh, based on how quickly they're going coming out of the, uh, the muzzle of the, of, of the gun that's shooting them and what the angle of elevation of the, the, the gun is. And for that, he constructed his own version of a ballistics pendulum. <coughs> this is one that's nicked from the internet. Uh, and I, again, I don't know how these, these, these work in detail. But this, is, this looks like a very Victorian version of a ballistics pe pendulum. I do have a more up-to-date one. Given, given to us from Glasgow University Anterior Museum. There, there is one actually on display in the museum. And you can see from that that the, the gun is firing at point blank range into the target pendulum and the extent of displacement of the pendulum gives you a measure of the muzzle speed. Tate constructed his own golf ball ballistics pen pendulum. It consisted of a big plate which was faced with clay. And the idea was that Freddie and some of his pals would hit golf balls into the middle of this golf ball ballistics pendulum. And again, he would be able to measure the amount of displacement. And so knowing the weight of the ball, he'd be able to calculate the speed of the initial speed of the golf ball of the club head. And during this, he did these experiments in the basement of the old university at, at Edinburgh. And it is said that obviously. Freddie and his pals, even though they were good golfers, weren't able to hit exactly 100% accurate shots as that particular point black range, point black range, the balls used to miss the pendulum and spin around and whiz around the laboratory. And he had the doorways um, covered with mats and cushions to prevent injury, but it, it was said to be exciting but hazardous. <laughs> and so he's doing this from a, a range of about four to, four to six feet, and he was able to make a, a, his first calculations of initial velocity of the uh, golf ball at two to three hundred feet per second. Obviously it would slow down in the air after that, but that was muzzle velocity of a golf ball. He then moved on to field observations, viewing the flight of balls from the first tee, just a hundred yards to our left, in the Victory Cup competition at St Andrews in 1891, and the observed various profiles the shots that were hit from the first tee, and you can see some of them there. Even some of them, see that, that one there, figure four, it started off with the biggest elevation, but it, it fell short of the rest of the range of, of shots that were being fired. And you can also see the shot of the crap players here, the good players, with the ball starting out low and it's soaring up and then finishing. 100, 180 yards was, was deemed to be a good drive in 1891 with a gutty ball. Now the only problem about Tate's observations and his measurements was that 
if you apply Bashford's a military engineer, you apply Bashford's calculation to how far the golf ball should be going, how, how quickly the ball, the ball should be hit to go under 180 yards, you're required a muzzle speed or a impact speed of 500 feet per second, which is about double what Tate had recognized in his, in his experiments in the labor laboratory. So the conclusion that he was coming to was that there was something else that was holding the ball in the air and creating a longer flight than the sheer initial speed of the hit. And from his knowledge of what Newton had observed 200 years previously, he hypothesized that the reason for the ball hanging in the air was underspin. He called it underspin. We call it backspin. But Professor T called it underspin. What he had to do now was to demonstrate that underspin actually happened. And he took some advice from a club maker in St Andrews called, I think it was Willie Wilson, W. Wilson. Go back into the basement of the laboratory in Edinburgh, hit some more balls into the pendulum from a range of four to six feet. And this time, you would attach to the ball thin piece of silk tape, unfolded so it was flat between where it was fixed on the floor to where it was sitting on the tee when Fred and his mates were going to be hitting it into the pendulum. This they did and they found that right enough the ball did bang into the pendulum, stick in the pendulum and the silk tape was folded over. Now it wasn't going to fold over many times in four feet or six feet, but it was a demonstration of the phenomenon. And what he also found was that if you take a mid-iron or a niblick, while your initial impact speed came down, the angle of the club was going up, you were hitting the ball more obliquely with greater spin, so you were getting more revolutions of the club in the four to six feet. So that experiment was concluded, and with a driver he calculated that the initial revolutions of a ball was 60 to 90 revolutions per second which is a lot of revolutions. Okay, so he demonstrated the phenomenon of underspin and he felt that underspin was a secret to long driving. So he went into publication with letters to the Scotsman golf magazine run by a Scotsman at that time and also badminton like magazine and he headed his letters. The whole focus of the thing was long driving. This is how you can increase the length of your drives by hitting with underspin. It has to be said at the time that his, co his colleagues, particularly the better players in St Andrews, never believed a word of what he was saying. <laughs> they said the pureness, the purity of the hit involves no spin whatsoever. So they couldn't bring themselves to believe that underspin or backspin is just a natural result of hitting the ball with an angled face. He didn't just report into the Scotsman and the popular magazines. He wrote into the, the scientific press as well. So he had articles published in Nature and in the proceedings of his local Royal Society, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, uh, from where that fancy diagram was, was published. So it's, he had peer-reviewed articles in the scientific press as well. 
The result, immediate, one of the immediate results of this was that he also tried to make his own clock that would impart more spin and therefore gain more length. I don't think that this particular clock, which is of adjustable loft, would, was of sufficient balance or quality to hit the ball any different or any better than an ordinary clock, but it would certainly destroy the surface of any gutty balls that you get with it. <laughs> that club sits in the collection of the Royal Scots Museum in Chimber Street. Uh, until fairly recently, it was used as a trophy for the Scottish University's Golfing Society. Uh, so I'll get a better picture of it one of these days when they answer my emails. Uh, but it's still there, and we know the accession of it to it. Also, around about this time, he wrote to the editor of Golf about his, this adjustable club that you've just seen a picture of. And he included a plan of uh, how the club was put together. And he said it was made by Aitken and Allen, who were some sort of instrument makers in Edinburgh. I don't think they were golf club makers, although uh, experts in the audience might tell me different. Um, and he also went on in the letter, written on RNA notepaper, drafted in RNA notepaper. He went on to say that all the local members totally disagree with what he's saying. There are skeptic, skeptics all around. The cracks don't believe me, he said. Um, and he also made the point that he wasn't trying to get patent for this. But he was conscious that if other people, club makers, cottoned on to the idea, they might try to patent the idea. So he was trying to prevent other people from patenting, patenting his idea. The next, round about that time, mid-90s, beginning of the 1900s, people started to put face markings onto clubs. And round about 19, by, by the time of the war came, 1914, there are all sorts of patterns, fancy patterns available, which are a rich source of collecting interest for people that now are called collector societies. There in particular is the deep ribbed mashing or click that was eventually banned by the RNA because it was so effective in producing backspin. Uh, and particularly used by Jock Hutchison in the 1921 Open here at St Andrews, just a hundred yards to our left. He was using that club, knocking it over the scorecard. And it is said that he could only use one ball, a ball, because again, the paint and the surface of the, the ball was being destroyed by the heavy ribbing of the club. We have another incident to do with uh, face markings in 1949 at the Ryder Cup at Gamp. Here's Max Faulkner and Arthur Lees discussing a complaint by Ben Hogan, the American captain, that the clubs of the British players were too deeply indented and were illegal. And the Organisation committee immediately got on to the great man of the moment, who was Bernard Darwin, again member of the RNA, just I think published uh, the post-war series of rules amendments, and they got Darwin to uh, examine the the club heads, and he was able to defuse the situation by saying nothing that a little bit of emery paper would solve. <laughs> I don't want to go into any detail about it, but face markings now is a live issue within the, in the rules. I haven't seen the latest rules. I, I don't suspect that they've changed. Uh, but the extent of the markings, the depth of the markings, the angle of the markings where they go down into the grooves is a sensitive area. And again, it was subject to major litigation in the 1980s, in 1980s with the pink operation. And the calculation of the curve uh, was, was the central part of that controversy at the time. 
uh, you're not allowed to have those sort of uh, deviating grooves in your golf clubs. Run about 1965, no, 1968, and there was a great initiative by the Golf Society of Great Britain. We've got Alistair Cochran and John Stobbs to do a great study on the science of golf. That's the book. Uh, and again, they went into uh, the way in which golf balls were hit, and the metrics of, uh, of golf ball flight in more detail with better equipment than tape that they were ever able to use, including uh, high-speed cameras, and that's the way in which you measure spin these days, and the way in which you measure uh, uh, impact speed. And computerized versions of these high-speed cameras uh, can, can give you measurements at the flick of a, a switch that uh, 100 years ago Professor Tate would take months to come for you. Again, they measured um, carry, an amount of spin, and the figures that we're seeing displayed there are comparable with, closely comparable with, the figure that Peter Tate was obtaining in his experiments with gutty balls in the early 1890s. I mean, again, I think that's another diagram out of uh, Cochrane's dogs. Um, but it explains the mechanics of uh, golf ball flight and why you get lift when the ball is hit with backspin. And the basic reason is that when it, the ball is proceeding at 200 feet per second and spinning at the same time at the rate of 60 revolutions per second, a microscopic point on the bottom of the ball is moving into the wind by an extra 26 feet per second. Whereas the, that same microscopic spot at the top of the ball, the speed is reduced by 26 feet per second. So that's a net increase of 50 odd feet per second. And the very fact that you've got that difference creates turbulence at the bottom right hand side of that ball round about four or five o'clock that produces the lift. I'm quite happy to receive better explanations than that from those in the audience who might know better than I do. <laughs> I'll just wrap up quickly ladies and gentlemen. Peter Tate died very soon after Freddie did. He was broken hearted after his son's death in 1900. He himself died in 1901. He's buried in St. John's Episcopalian Church in the west end of uh, Princess Street, which is where he used to worship. He lived in the new town before he died. Uh, and just coincidentally, if you wait for a bus at the west end of Princess Street, beside the railings to St. John's Church, one of the 30 or 40 big benches that you get beside the bus stops is dedicated to Freddie Tate. So here we have it, Freddie, heroic player, winner of two amateur championships, cruelly cut down by a sniper's bullet, modern valley in 1900. Professor Tate, nothing like the same proficiency as at golf, but providing us with an understanding of how golf balls move when they're hit with spin and influencing to the modern, modern day and in an important way uh, the way in which club heads are designed, particularly iron club heads. That's all I've got to say ladies and gentlemen, I'd be happy to take questions.